Take well, it away. Steve Beebe, I'm from the Community Eco Center or store in town. Um, we're going to be talking about off-grid living and the, possibly the different levels of off-grid living uh, versus um, actually completely off-grid, disconnected from the grid, including no phones and no internet, which is another thing. Heresy. <laughs> it used to be everywhere now. It's, yeah. So, um, how many of you have been camping, tent camping for more than a day? Okay. Um, with no access to electricity or toilets. Okay. How about uh, without bringing your own water? So that last group, that's off grid. Yeah. So if you don't bring your own water, you have to find your own water. If you find, if you find your own water, that's it. That's just the one thing Okay. Yeah. Is that all right? Okay. I'm leaning against my props. Um, so if you find your water, then you have to know whether it's potable or not. I'll start with that. Actually, I'll run down something. If you're camping, you need water, some sort of shelter. If it's an extended camping, you need sanitation, you need food. Um, you don't need to cook your food, but you just need some food, say for you know, three, four, five days. But um, that said, when I used to, I used to go camping in California in the 60s and 70s, we used to go back in the mountains far enough that we would just let the water come into our hand. If there was nothing swimming in it, we would drink it. It would be fine, completely fine. Um, now, that one issue we're dealing with now is if there's anything upstream or if there anything that was upstream in where, one area of California, uh, behind uh, Santa Barbara, they had quicksilver mines, which is mercury. Um, so unless you were really up high, the water down there could contain mercury, even though it tends to not float, you know. But um, I'm going to show you something real quick. There are a few things available other than straight up filtering your water through something. This is a life straw. You may have seen this. If anybody traveled overseas, it probably could have used one of these. This is pretty much, it's literally a straw. You pull that off, open this up, stick it in your source of water and drink the water. It's, it's a little protective against more, most waterborne contaminants. You're prevented from getting cholera, chiraria, things like that. But um, the thing about this is you can wear it around your neck. You can do over 200 gallons of water, which means you can be out for quite a while and just use, literally use this to drink the water. Um, not for cooking or anything, of course. This particular item, this is a, uh, this basically an ultraviolet. It has no batteries in it, but uh, you filter your water, get the large chunks out of it, anything that could cause it to uh, be too turbid. Um, literally put this in the water for X number of seconds per ounce. Let it sit there. It's an ultraviolet light. Um, they call this a steri pin, and I was told the reason they call this a steri pin is it doesn't kill the bacteria that's in the water. It sterilizes it. So the bacteria is in there, the stuff is alive, you drink it, it goes through you, but it doesn't proliferate, so you're okay. Interesting. So the stuff's still alive. Yeah. And then there are other filters if you're really out for a long time. This is a company called British Brookefeld. These filters have been around, uh, I'd say, for maybe 75 years or more. It's a UK company, it's, um, it's a ceramic candle, they call it. You could literally make a structure, put this in it, fill it up with water, a little teeny hole in the bottom. What drips out there is filtered. Um, these are available uh, pretty much worldwide. A company called um, Berkey brought, bought the rights for British Berkey in the United States and created their own um, carbon filter. These are, these are around, same thing with this, you can buy the unit or you can simply make your own unit. As long as you filter the water, the water that comes out is purified, you can drink it. But this uh, this will filter out 
uh, massive number of, of things that this doesn't or can't. I think this might even contain some silver, I'm not sure. But um, so on the flip side of the, the spectrum is, OK, you've got a source of water. You don't want to mess up your water. So you have to go to the bathroom somewhere away from where you drink, or you have to contain it. Um, I brought this just as a sample. This is a composting toilet. This is a dry composting toilet. You don't flush it. It doesn't go anywhere. If somebody dare, you could do all your business right here, right now, and it would just stay in there and eventually dry out. What this does, this is a, this is a unit that's made for, uh, for using in boats or RVs so it can stand jostling. Typically, they're self-contained. It has a tumbler on it. I'll let you guys mess around with this later and come over. <laughs> but um, you open it up, drop some of your compound in there, which is usually, this, this company is made in Canada. They have a, a um, hemp and uh, peat moss combination. You drop it in there, do your business, tumble it, close it. The electrified version of this has a heating tray and an exhaust fan that runs all the time. It dries it out. Pulls out the smell. This particular one's made for boats. This is going to be a 12 volt type of situation. It has like a two watt fan up here, like a little computer rack fan. It just continually evacuates the odor and dries out what you do. Um, number one and number two go in here. There's no separate P thing for this. There's another company I'll tell you about if you're so inclined or if you want to. Now this, this type of unit would cost $1,700, $1,800. They make them up to full household units that, that flushed like a, a pint or eight ounces per flush. And the unit's very large, but it's electrified, so you have to have electricity. If you're off grid, it really sucks because you can't you can't have 75 watts running all the day, all the time. <clears throat> you can turn it off during the night, but um, you don't want this competing with your stored power during the day. But uh, the non-electric version. You can put a two watt fan, exhaust fan on it, like get a little five watt solar panel, put it on top of your outhouse or wherever it happens to be, and all during the day that would evacuate the air. It has no heating tray on it, nothing, so it just naturally dries everything out. Now, there's some literature here, you can look at the different things that they make. But um, over here, um, Electrifying your off-grid residence is not necessary. So if you want to um, simply have a light, you can get something like this with a little solar panel on it. It has a little battery in there and a little some lights like that. And this can light up a small camp. If it was pitch black in here, this would light up most of this area right here. But um, so this. That type of thing's really great. It's inflatable. It's really good for backpacking. Though I people, I've seen people use this for extended time. We use these at home. We just put these under the umbrellas outdoors, and it works fine. But the different levels of this, some of these will actually charge the cell phone. Um, it is completely inflatable. This thing will completely collapse once I undo that, and it comes out flat. So this is a, a portable thing for more lightweight stuff. What's the name of this? Oh, this is. What's this called? Lucy. Lucy. Like L-U-C-I. Lucy Light. But uh, they make different configurations of this. But this is a sample of a small uh, pot, uh, it's a battery pack, basically what it is. This, the, the solar panel is a bunch of small panels. It's just a little over 5 watts. It charges this, which is a battery, which in turn charges a small device. Really, just a cell phone. But um, I did take this out with my uh, non iPhone, my Android phone, to plug this in directly to it and just set this in the sun and the phone was charging. Though you really want to be able to control the charge, you don't want to have it fluctuating too much uh, for your phone. You don't want to mess your phone up, but this is a broken phone. So. But, um, oh, yeah, and that. Um, so if you have your hand, you charge this up, you stick it in your pocket, you go off, and your, your phone starts to get low, you just pull this out and charge your phone up. Those uh, solar panels. How long do they last? What kind of life do they have? Uh, this, these are not really super good ones, like five to seven years maybe for this kind here. Somebody was asking about the, uh, the 
footprint, the carbon footprint of solar panels. And from what I read and been told, that it's offset in about seven or eight years. So if you have solar panels in your home, the energy that it takes to develop them and all the dirty stuff that they put into them is, is kind of... Is, uh, Did you say how energy. long it took to charge that battery? Oh, this, this would probably take about uh, three hours, two hours in the okay. sun, in full sun. I've done it before in the back of the shop. Now on the flip side, if you were to... I've, I've been in two places that are people are living off-grid 100% and they are not like I might do in a simple camping situation or just for a low period of time, but they've been doing it for uh, 10, 15 years. Um, they have a very large version of this type of thing. I think they have about a 3,000 watt inverter. This inverts DC, which is solar panels, to AC. Um, so basically, solar panels, plug into charge controller, charge controller feeding, this is the <laughs> That's okay, I just had my cell phone under there. <laughs> but um, the charge controller um, controls the amount of charge that goes into the battery so you don't overcook the battery or cause them to get too hot. Um, and it also tells you the load and what's going on with a couple of buttons you can push. And then at, at night when you're getting no sun, um, plugs in right at the end. This is just a regular 110 outlet with the GFI or GFCI. So you just plug it in and you can run this particular one. You can run a thousand watts up to the point that your batteries run out of power. And I think through lead acid you usually don't want to take them much below 50% capacity. This is a sample of about a 140 pound battery that this is a 6 volt, 410 amp hour battery. This is really made for just off grid. It has no cranking power like your car battery. Car batteries are like 105 amp hours. Um, and they're 12 volt. So this particular system wants 24 volts to run. So they would need six of those to run this. Frankly, I wouldn't waste my time with that. I'd probably get two or three thousand watt if I had six of those. But um, there's some math calculations that you can do to get a uh, calculation for how many amp hours or how many amps watts you can run during the night when your batteries are topped off and they're going to start draining and then how many hours it takes your solar panels to charge up your batteries. The thing I like about uh, certain off-grid systems is if you get enough power to run your utilities, let's say you have uh, uh, not your same, because you have a television, you have, uh, well, you could have a sump pump, you could have, you'll have a refrigerator, you'll have a few other things that you want to keep running um, when the sun goes down. Um, you can calculate to how many watts you're going to use and how many amp hours you're going to need, uh, and then decide how many batteries you want to feed during the night or store the energy into here, and how many solar panels you're going to, it takes to feed those batteries so that at the end of the day everything's topped off. It's keeping up with or uh, up beyond um, what you're draining during the day because you'll be pulling um, energy out during the day. The refrigerator will turn off and on and a few other things. So you always want to keep your solar panels charging beyond what you need during the day so they're always topped off because at night they're just going to be straight down. But now you can ask any questions during if you want. I want it to be a little more interactive than it is. But um, I just made a few notes here. I think really, if you don't cook food, you can really do quite well. And if you decide to cook food, then you're going to have to either get find a, kind of like a little, like a little vertical rocket stove. It's really, it's actually quite heavy and really thick. <coughs> this particular type of thing, you can either make one. Rocket stove. You, you literally feed sticks into this, <coughs> twigs and sticks, and they start to burn and all the energy is concentrated on you. Put your pan there, you put a grill on that or something. But this, this one also allows you to um, put charcoal in there. So if you happen to have major charcoal or have charcoal, you can put the charcoal in there, close that, you'll draw some in there, air in there, and keep that burning quite hot. But these are neat. These are, uh, these are the type of things that you can 
not take with you, but if you have a camp, once you get the camp established, you can have, have this type of thing set up. They, they even make one of two of these, about a half inch thick sheet of steel and the chimney comes out the back. But other than that, you're gonna have to get <coughs> propane. And once you use propane, you're hike the grid again, because you've got to go get the propane. Yeah. So, but um, depending on your independence, the people that I know have, have one of those, those refrigerators that they, they have in campers or RVs. It has, um, I believe it's AC, DC, or propane. Runs, you can run in any one. So if you're driving in your RV, you can run off your DC stuff if you happen to have that. And then when you pull up to your camp, you can plug it into what they call shore power if you have electric available at the camp, like a, some campsite. Or if you happen to have, um, let's say you have propane tanks, and you can run the propane tanks to help run the, um, we'll call it compressor, but um, which is kind of cool. So I stayed at this house, and we had a party in the house. We had like 20 people over there. Stereo music, a couple of lights around. They had a couple of little LED lights, and they had a lot of uh, they had a fire going. And I just realized these guys are off the grid, and this place is just jumping with energy, you know. But um, not too many lights. I mean, you could take, you could get a regular incandescent, incandescent bulb that's a 40 watt clear and just put it up here. It would be enough light for this room. Or you could do LED and uh, make it, it could be quite a bit of light. But depending on what you want to do. But um, other than that, I'm thinking the thing I came across was um, there's a sustainability aspect of living off grid. And if you're not able to do something like collect your water, um, you'll need to have a, a source of water, um, a source of sun, shelter, and electricity is really an extra. But um, as far as cooking goes, you know, I just I would just use logs and a fire. And but it, in California. You may not, somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I know I was driving through this area and then I was just helping a friend move and uh, I was raised in California. It's just really a tinderbox there. And it, all the, everything's extremely dry. Probably the next couple months will be worse. But um, they had the meter, the, the thing for the extreme, the, the fire thing. So this meter in, um, what was the park? I live near French Creek up there. But it just had flopped down past the, the whatever the lowest thing was. Yeah. And the ground was wet. The humidity was like 85%. You know, you could just throw a cigarette out. It would probably go out before it hit the ground, you know. Mm. But um, I'd never seen one just, they literally had it at the, the mi a mile or minimum, and it sort of fell, and physically fell off. <laughs> 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 and I, you know, it was really, really wet. But, um, I want to keep this fairly short. I think, um, other than that, I just had some quick notes, but I think, other than that, I'd like to do like a Q&A type of thing if anybody... These stoves are just for outside, right? There's no way to... No, it, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, it is for outside because all the smoke's going to be coming out of here. The hotter it burns, the smoke would be less, but you don't want to have this outside. No, this, this is strictly outside, and it's also, you can't pack this. It's, it weighs about eight pounds or something. But, um, and the solar stuff, it really is amazing what you can do with solar, but um, mm -hmm. the fact that you can get a fairly simple system and then um, it's a scalable thing, so you could just go according to what you need to keep amping it up. More batteries, more power, more solar panels, uh, more ready power. They used to call this, a friend of mine that put this together he called it a camp system because when you go out camping, you, can, you might have these, it's like 80 watts, two 40 watt solar panels, and you might have a 12 volt battery, maybe two. You're camping at night, you got some lights on, you're running your computer, you're doing some other stuff, and your power starts to go down, go down, and you want to stop at about 50% for these types of batteries. It's a lead acid, lead acid battery. And then the next day, sun comes up, you get the battery up about 80%. Next day it goes down, next day it comes up about 70. So after the fourth day, you literally might have to stop using that altogether for maybe two or three days or just go home if you wanted to use power.
but if you really wanted to have it scalable, you could have a bunch of solar panels and a bunch of batteries, and, and then you could you could run indefinitely with as long as the sun comes up. Yeah. A couple of questions. Yeah. One. Where would a fuse go into the system? Oh, so, uh, I'm sorry. Solar panel. Uh, yeah, here. Charge I'm controller. Sure. You can about the fuse. It's right here. You can put a battery after the uh, inverter. Yeah, this is what happens is the uh, the positive comes through the same fuse, which also goes to the, the inverter. But the, uh, the negative comes right off the battery. So the positive goes through solar panel through here, through the fuse. I think it's to keep those things from feeding back into the, the, the inverter. But you can take a look at it right here. You can see the way it's all set up. This is all done with a uh, uh, welding cable. So this is, it's, I, I've used this before, and it, it functions really nicely. And, uh, to, you said not to drop the batteries below 50%. How That's would you set up a gauge on that? Uh, usually, there's, with a good charge controller, because it's always a good idea. It comes back up. You can read, you know, some of the batteries, I was reading about a company that was kind of floundering a little bit, excuse me, that had a, um, uh, a salt water based battery. The thing I love, I heard and I read about that, that they're rather large like that, but maybe about that tall. And um, they can be taken down to empty, and if they fall over, it's just a bunch of salt water, which, and that is lead acid. Yes. It's, uh, if this requires maintenance, like this, you have to do the maintenance, like the old car batteries. Um, you have to, there's off-gassing with that a little bit. Usually when those are stored, they store them in a cabinet, and they put the, the top of the cabinet at an angle about like this, so nobody puts anything on the cabinet, and it has some holes in it. If you're able to, you can put a little tiny fan and just allow the air to evacuate so it's not trapped in anything. But, um, yeah, those are pretty serious, but, those are like, I think, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, I think they're over 95% recyclable yeah. of lead acid batteries, whereas a lot of other batteries aren't, and some really aren't at all. Um, I know some other ones that are coming up in the future will have some other stuff. For, if, uh, so, Steve, if you were, say you were using this in your house, you were off grid, yeah. and you had, what did you say you would need, like, Oh, yeah, you have to do the math. You sort of work back from all the stuff that you use in your house. You go, how many watts am I doing? But how long do they last? Those batteries, they should last at least, at least with proper maintenance, at least seven years. Yeah. That battery right there probably runs, I'd say $600 for one battery. I'd have to look that up, but they're, uh, <coughs> they're expensive. And the stored energy is, is just is the most difficult part of living off the grid, because you have to store the energy. You just, and you can have a wind turbine that can charge the batteries. The wind turbine can go through uh, some sort of voltage regulator. Um, but you usually need stored in energy so that the power that you get is constant. You can't have your power going up and down. You see if you get a 1,000 watt wind turbine, <coughs> and the wind starts to go down a little bit, then it whips up to like 30 miles an hour. You have to have something that keeps it just mm. dead on. And as you know, a lot of uh, electronics don't respond well to uh, <laughs> power functions. This is a true, this is a pure sine wave inverter, so it has, uh, it's, it's better for most electronics. It has a sine wave that goes like this as opposed to like that. And I don't know a lot about that, but I heard that. The not pure sine wave inverter is not good. They're about half the price. So it depends on what you're running. Do you have any of this stuff going at your house or the store? Not yet. I have a small version of this. I was talking to somebody today back there about um, something like this to run our sump pump. So when the power goes out, uh, as you know, the power goes out usually when there's a big storm, something like that. So. Uh, Power goes out. I'll tell you something interesting. If you have solar panels on your roof and you're tied to the grid, the power goes out, you have no power, just like everybody else. The inverter that's in your house, big huge thing, 3,000, 5,000 watt, it's made to shut off completely. It could be sunny, the grid goes down, the inverter shuts off, everything in your house goes off. 
you're dead just like everybody down the block, even though you could be generating 5,000 watts off your roof. The reason is it's grid tied. They don't want you feeding back into the grid and electrocuting some line worker. So that's that issue. But if you do a hybrid system, grid goes down, you go, oh dear, and click. Now you're pulling power from your batteries, not sending anything back to the grid. You're able to pull power from your batteries and run what people call a critical load. Let's say it's your refrigerator, your sump pump, a couple house fans, and a light, something like that. And that's, that's a doable thing. There are systems, however, that run, that are grid tied, where it has um, you have a couple batteries, you have an inverter, that plugs into the grid. Your sump pump, in this particular case I was talking about, your sump pump plugs into that. While the grid is running, it is taking power off the grid and going into your sump pump. As soon as the grid stops running, it flips over and starts drawing power from the batteries to your sump pump for a while. But since there's no solar involved and the grid stays down, at, at some point the batteries are going to fail. But that would really work for the most part it, around here that the power goes out for minutes or maybe an hour or something like that typically, and that would run, run your stuff. But if you're fully off-grid, you really, really, really have to be careful about your electric usage, especially if you have um, a well, because a well requires power to pump it up, power to get it, to get some pressure, like 40 psi or whatever the well is. And then you have to have something like this, like some, uh, some sort of a filtration system and probably an ultraviolet light to keep the engine so always taking power. And every time you turn the faucet on, you hear the the pump running a little bit. It's taking power out of your battery, so you take short showers, you do all this other stuff, and um, just learn how to make it work. I was at a campsite once where they had 50 cents. It was up in Vermont. We're at a solar camp thing, and it was 50 cents for five minutes of shower. Uh -huh. <laughs> Give me five minutes. After a while, I was showered. Everything's done, and I'm sitting there like. You still have like a minute left. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's five minutes. I mean, if you really, if you're really intentional, right. at, at your approach, it, it really works. And that, you know, it's uh, that's what this guy did. I talked about. It was cool too. It was cool. Yeah, you do what you got to do. <laughs> there's, there, there's two temperatures. There's cold and colder. Never <laughs> mind. Is there anything I'm missing? Oh, now, as far as water collection, if you're not in a situation where you can get water, I mean, it's you're going to have to have a cistern or something. This is only 220 liters. It's like 58 or 59 gallons. But um, if you get your water collected from a roof, preferably, it, it's better if you can get it off of a tin roof versus, I mean, a painted roof that doesn't have lead in the paint and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, it's easier to filter and less toxic. If it's a shingle roof, um, uh, that asphalt shingle will have some stuff in it, but generally a high-end filter would take out that type of thing. You could probably filter it to a moderate degree if you were able to get some head pressure by having that up high enough where it could feed down and take a shower. There are a couple of shower units that are available that rely on, um, other than a black bag up in a tree, that there's one that has uh, you can use a propane tank. You have a propane tank, source of water, shower. You know, so that the propane heats up. It's it's a uh, it's the pipe. What do you guys? Point of use kind of thing. Yeah. So that um, literally the water runs through it. It's just a radiator that's being heated by flame, and you get like a it was 85 or 95 degree shower out of it, which is that's not bad. I mean, it's that's a shower, you know. And the unit was this big, like that. You just hang it in a tree. Get your water hoisted up so you get a little head pressure. And it runs off a garden hose. But this type of thing can work. Collecting rain in most of and I know it's okay in Chester County. I think it's okay in the entire state of Pennsylvania. Our rainwater doesn't drain into, uh, for the most part, doesn't drain into a reservoir like in a lot of places in California where they rely on that water. So if you're capturing water, you're keeping that runoff from filling a reservoir, which in turn gives you water, I mean, municipal water. But um, if you can collect water here, it's so much better for everything. Because yeah, the stuff that runs off now is just, it 
it just runs off into the drain and just goes away and back into the Schuylkill Yeah, so, but, um, Excuse me. Yes, if you didn't have, you know, I wouldn't want to use water off my roof, but I'm, I'm going to make my own rain barrel, but couldn't I use a funnel or something else to collect the water? Yeah, you know, no, I saw one. Yeah, you can. Like, you know, I know, like you know, once there's that rain dripping funnel. in there, it'll take place. There was a uh, park, I think it was in New York, they were doing some small uh, garden projects, and it had a, uh, a funnel about yeah. from Mark for the camera. I think. Mm -hmm. To me, I would say it's about 15 yeah. feet in diameter. Oh, well, that's huge. Going to <laughs> well, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> you could. I had somebody ask me, I said, well, if I get that, it's really not going to fill up with much water. And I said, no. But if you're able to get anything, even um, a four by eight sheet of plywood, tilted with a little drain on it, that at the bottom, I designed something for the, um, the uh, garden up there. I can't really do everything that I wanted them to do, but it was going to have a solar panel, four by eight sheet of plywood, tilted south facing, so you get shade, and you'd have a place to put all your plants and do your potting and all that kind of stuff there, it would generate electricity, so if you were to work at night, you could turn the light on or something like that, with a small battery. And it would fill a rain barrel at the same time. But that, if you can control the roof that it comes off of, that water's not that bad. And most of these, this, this type of filter, will, the better filters will, as far as drinking goes, will take care of uh, an asphalt shingle mm -hmm. uh, contaminants. The older your roof is, it's kind of a the newer the roof is, the more fresh the asphalt is, and at some point it becomes, uh, it's kind of weird, it, it's, it has less asphalt to it, you know, with the sun's on and everything, and then at some point after that it starts to break down and it gets more, mm -hmm. it's kind of messed up, so. But you don't want to really drink from that, ever. I use it for on my plants, and my plants are doing great, without any filtration. But. But this, this particular one, this happened to be uh, olive oil from Greece, so it uh, it's, has a little olive oil coating on the inside, it's food grade. Uh, I think it's kind of cool about that is, the less the guy cleans them who, who retrofits these, you can smell the olive oil in it, and at worst it would leave a little film on the top, which means no mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Even though there's a little thing on it, but um, if I was doing something, I would probably just, I would get something off the I would find a place that has a well, or that well is possible, or uh, the creek that I can get water from on a regular basis. If you have a well, you can set up a solar panel. They can literally pull the water up while the sun's up uh, at a certain rate, depending on the diameter and the number of feet. Um, fill some kind of a cistern, and then have a way of filtering that and keeping it clean uh, for your showers and so on. We're having a problem in Africa now with uh, uh, cholera because of people's sanitation, somebody has a well over here, somebody has their poop pile over here, and they don't have any like pile or area or dug out, you know. It gets into the water and they bring it up over here and they used to have really good water, now they're getting called. So, and the biggest bummer about that is, okay, I can get my water, I can filter it, do all this stuff, and now I want to take a shower. What are you going to do? It's your biggest organ. You're going to bathe yourself and contaminate the water, and you're going to get called. So that's been an issue. It's like going down to uh, some place where they don't have very good water and ordering a salad. You get bottled water, you get all the stuff, you get a salad, it's rinsed off with this horrible water, you get the salad, and there you go. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer. Any more questions? What about solar ovens? Oh, I, have, I didn't bring it. It's kind of a big thing to lug around. Those really work well. There, there are solar ovens that are made. Uh, there are different types of them. Some of them, usually most of them just have a couple, maybe three reflective panels mm -hmm. and a um, sort of a black box with a tempered piece of glass on it where you can put something underneath that and that would heat up. Um, maybe small chunks of meat, um, vegetables, rice, things like that. You can vary it, but those would get quite hot. And then some have a very, really large sort of a a circular parabolic kind of a structure and then sort of a, I've seen it's very strange, it's sort of a, a section that's in the middle, you just stick your pan floating in the middle, sort of in the middle of the air and this, all this stuff focuses onto that pan and then it just boils. And that, 
I, I, I was told by somebody, I don't know if this is true or not, is anybody aware of those, uh, those rear projection TVs? You know, and they have kind of a parabolic lens on them? Yeah, I've heard. I was told the lenses are deadly or really good. Yeah. So it's like having a magnifying glass like this big and that thick. It's called a Fresnel lens. Fresnel lens, yeah. yeah. So you can imagine getting us on focused into a spot like that. You could probably melt metal after a while. Yeah, I know people that would drive around if they saw one of those rear projection TVs, they would take it, take it apart just for that lens. Yeah, get that lens. So if you had that lens and you were able to control the focus of that lens, to a pot, you could probably boil the water in a few minutes. I saw some other thing, I, I haven't tried it yet, but a guy took four poles, or six poles, hexagon, I can't remember the shape, put some plastic on it, filled it with water, and then found the focal point of that with the sun overhead and started cooking. That would heat things up, just by virtue of making a lens out of water. Plastic. I think it's possible. I saw it on the web, so it must be true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it sound possible to anybody who's familiar with that kind of stuff? Yeah. I don't think so. I'm looking at him every once in a while. They're making some solar ovens out of those evacuated glass tubes, too. Like they use for um, oh, yeah. the solar heat. And yeah, whatnot. for solar hot water. Yeah, they've got a little thing that slides in. Oh, I saw those. Those are really cool. Yeah, it's like this little tube. It's a it's like a curved parabolic lens and just put your food into it. It's a circular thing. They're a little pricey, but they're really intense. And so, so anyone who doesn't know those tubes, it's it's um, it's like a tube inside a, a glass tube inside a glass tube, and in between there's a vacuum. So all the light that goes in, the heat goes into your food, but it doesn't come out because it's insulated, just like your double pane lens. Stuck. Yeah, it's stuck inside. That. Yeah, it's very cool. I saw those online. Can't remember the name of that company, mm -hmm. but. Um, that's another thing you could do. You can do uh, solar or hot water. You could do it a couple of ways, literally painting a panel black, sticking a bunch of copper in there and have some little, you could do it just by having it black and getting hot from the sun. Or you can have some little parabolic uh, reflectors and put the tube right down there and get it nice and hot and have a little circulation pump and have that circulate and get it into a, a tank and use it for your showers. But it's just fairly complicated and it takes a lot of a lot of maintenance and a lot of plumbing and knowledge that I don't have. But, uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned the solar panel typically last five to seven years, but something like that, yeah. Uh, oh, no, the solar panels, yeah, these will last 20 to 25 years. So, mm -hmm. what makes a good solar panel versus a mediocre solar panel? I don't know. I, there's, they're getting better and better. I think used to, there's the efficiency rate, I think years ago, it was around 12 to 14 percent. 15 now if it's around 20 or 25 they're raving about it as far as efficiency goes but there's um, if anybody knows this correctly if I'm wrong there's a uh, there's monocrystal and then there's um, polycrystal this is a polycrystal one so it has if you're able to look at it closely it has basically little shards of solar material in it you know and I heard that a monocrystal works better except there's more Waste. So they have, I don't know if I'm saying this right, maybe an ingot. So it's a, a, a big, it's like a core of the uh, silicone material, and they cut it with a laser, and it gets cut. So when you see a solar panel with these sort of somewhat octagon shape, but maybe just the outside edges are, so it has like little blocks all in it, that's usually a, a single crystal which has been cut. A lot more efficient, but a lot more waste. In, make it and this is made uh, pieces of that so to speak like where they were but there's some debate about that uh, these are really super efficient and, and most of the ones I see now are like this anyway they don't have the uh, single ingot I think that's how they're made so we can look that up and see I think they're just a cut it's like super thin I have some of the material at, at, uh, or at the store and it's um, it's like about a one millimeter or slightly less than one millimeter thick sheet of, of glass. There's glass in it and it's just coated. And it's just extremely delicate. So they put that in here and, and laminate it and all this other stuff. And, and there's some precious metals in here and there's some toxic metals and some other stuff. I was telling a kid that was going to college, I said, you know, if I was going to college, I wouldn't do 
everything that everyone else is doing. I would learn how to delaminate and recycle solar panels and remove all the precious metals, remove the glass, remove the aluminum, remove the everything else that's in there, break it down, and reuse it. And stuff that's not reused is recycled. I don't know anybody that's doing that. And I thought that would be a good way to make a living moving forward. These are going to be coming off off the market as things get better. This this array could be 120 watts versus <coughs> it's 80 watts now, you know, as just things get better per square inch and so on. Some of the really fine things like uh, uh, the side of your house and some of the paint, some of the shingles and all that kind of stuff takes a lot to make power. Except if you were to paint the entire side of a building or have the south east and west part of the building coated with something that could generate electricity, that would be fantastic. I mean, it, would, it would be expensive, but uh, you could probably generate quite a bit. Any other questions? But uh, I think it would be great if you guys could come up and look at this stuff. But Another question over here. Um, what kind of, you said you could have a bank of batteries, and what kind of uh, hook up with the wires, what kind of configurations can you get with the yeah, this one, there's a series and there's a parallel thing. You can do a series parallel. You can combine like two 12 volt batteries to make 24 volts, two more 12 volt batteries to make 24 volts, and then take one from one end to the other. So you have 24 instead of 48 going into that, but you now have four batteries doing the work of two. So you're spreading out the energy. Yeah, it, if you go online, there's a series and there's a parallel setup. So one, you actually connect negative to positive if you have two 12 volts, and you connect that, and in other words, positive to positive, negative to negative. Yes? Oh, sorry. Well, no. any, any other questions? What does a panel cost like that one? Just curious. Oh, well, it's just like one of these panels would be like $79, something like that. And then they, could, they go up, usually, the 12 volt systems, all these are these are coming out with around 17 volts, or give or take, something like that. The big panels that you see on the side of a house or on a house are usually coming in with, or I think, close to 30 volts. So you really can't use it on one of these. It's just too much. Mm -hmm. You have to get a, a special inverter, which is a lot larger, just to bring it down so you can actually charge batteries with it. But um, there's some systems out there. There's a company called Apollo that makes, uh, it's a U.S. company, they make um, an inverter charger in one box. It might be about three or four grand. It's 4,000 watts stackable. It's a U.S. made, UL approved, military spec kind of thing. It's a super deal. And um, that you can stack. In other words, you move 4,000, 8,000, 12,000, so on, and watts. But uh, those, um, those require some knowledge of electronics because you have to be able to feed it properly. The cool thing about it is that type of system can take power from wind turbines, micro hydro, solar panels, and generators. Um, I believe the uh, the three off grid things with uh, the wind, solar, and uh, water. Neither of those are working for some reason. That's wind stops, creek dries up, and there's no sun it'll pull, it'll turn the generator on. And that's gas powered or diesel or something like that. But um, that's a really cool system. And if you guys have any paper, or you can come talk to me later, um, there's three websites that I really enjoy going to. And um, I can tell you what they are. One of them is um, Technology for the Poor. <laughs> These are all three dot com. Technology for the poor. Um, build it solar. Another one. The build it solar dot com. The build it solar one is great because it has tons of different things in it. Uh, and the other one is a low tech magazine. And if you go to those three, you'll find more information than I could ever give you. It's Low Tech Magazine, it's the third one, and Build It Solar. Build It Solar. Build It Solar. Um, 
some of those, uh, I think Billet Solar, you can, you can drill down and these guys will describe their successes and their failures with systems and they do off-grid stuff. Off Most of it's pretty much off-grid. It's a dot com, so they'll have some ads in there too. Let's say um, you wanted to buy solar panels and go off grid in a neighborhood like this. Okay? <laughs> yeah, no. Go completely I might, off grid. I might do that next year. Yeah. Well, I was wondering because I. But don't tell anybody. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Keep people it to will yourself. still be connected up to the house. Um, but it won't be well, I was reading an article about it in uh, Mother Earth News, and I was a little confused. It, the person that was doing it, and I don't know what state it was in, but they had to pay back for using solar the, the, to the equivalent of the electricity that person would use during the time they were in the house. Is, it, is that the right thing? That sounds like what some system. states would do, except for Vermont. No, if you That's cut off the grid, they can't charge you for that. But if you do mixed use, if you're on the grid and you're using their electricity, there's now starting to be charges. Uh, for them to give you juice, since you're only using it when you need it, because right. they don't like having to right. sometimes carry all the solar people, sometimes not. Okay. Yeah. So they're starting well, to push yeah. back. Yeah. They're starting to push but back. But if you're totally off, they can't charge you for that. Yeah, if you're off, because okay. people I know they're off good, they have nothing. There's, there's like well, Amish, there's not a cable or thing going to their house. They have their own well, their own septic, their right. own power. But if you do that here, you do a hybrid system which at some point they're going to come check you out. <laughs> my bills are really, really, really low for the store. My last bill, the charges that Pico charges, all their taxes and all that kind of stuff that they have, was more than my kilowatt hour usage. Oh, wow. Wow. My kilowatt hour usage, usage was around $14. My bill was $36. Wow. So, it's so I couldn't, I mean, that's it. Mean, you can't get any lower. I mean, that turns so stuff did on. they check you out? No, it's been that way all the time. It's just during uh, certain hours, uh, I mean months, where I'm not using a lot of heat or uh, air conditioning. I just turn, tend to turn the fan off or the AC so it just circulates the air, but it doesn't have any using much power. But you could do, yeah, that's a, that's a concern though, because I was considering. I've heard that they, do, they have checked people out yeah. when they have real low energy bills. Yeah, so they can check me out, it's fine. They just don't use very much. <laughs> But the, uh, the thing is that if you get, um, that's my concern. I was going to do a hybrid system, so I'm tied up to the grid. I'm sending power back to the grid. They, the grid gets to use, in my particular case, 3,000 less watts of power because I'm sending energy back to the grid. They don't know how to manage it. They're not Hawaii. They're not California. They're in Pennsylvania. They, hasn't, they haven't figured out how to deal with it. I'm generating maximum power at max at peak power use. So at three o'clock in the afternoon, if I have 5,000 watts worth of stuff on my roof, I'm generating 5,000 watts. I may be only using 1,000 or 2,000 if I have my AC running, but I'm pushing, I'm pushing back some energy during peak power. And they, they just dump energy all the time. They just dump it. You know, they don't even know what to do with it. And like he said, if, if I do a hybrid system, have a bank of batteries, and at night I just go whack, turn the grid off until I need to run my electric stove or I have, if I need to run an AC or something. Um, I'm sure I need to deal with it you know, somehow. But they can just let see what the issue is. They should just, Pico makes some money. I mean, I, I'm not paying Pico for my energy. I, I pay a uh, third party. It's, it's all brokered and everything like that. I mean, I'm paying for PA grid. Green Mountain Energy. Yeah. You're going to have there's, solar. There's which you're going to have green energy. Craig, what is your background? Do you teach this? Or no. You just learned it yourself? Computer. Uh, I was a bicycle mechanic. Mm -hmm. uh, I drove forklifts. <laughs> I worked in a warehouse. Find all this on the internet. Oh, I'm making software. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, no, I did. I worked for software. I did research. But uh, I've been doing this for the last eight years. She knows all about you, so she can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, not everything. I can tell her how to get there. No, you can. Oh, Mother Earth magazine is great. You can find some back issues of that. I've, I've got a couple of things so. that are really in pretty good detail. With those websites, if you dig down enough, and then you need to talk to people who have actually done that type of thing and live that way, um, 
you can confirm that, but you have to just move carefully. Yeah. yeah, our friends do, who are totally off the grid, they're outside Keene, New Hampshire, they do Airbnb if you oh, ever nice. go there and want to. Oh, how about that? Oh, yeah. wow. So you could you know, experience it. Well, that's yeah, cool. it's surprisingly <laughs> uneventful. <laughs> it's uneventful, Toilet but it's kind of fun work. because you see what they do. <laughs> Yeah. I have a friend uh, who uh, does micro um, micro um, water, water oh, my, hydro hy my, micro hydro and uh, he um, didn't get it but he applied for this, uh, this 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 thing that was happening with the uh, um, the Pentagon was having was was putting out bids for people to collect the dripping water from the air conditioners and turn it into micro hydro power. I thought that was pretty amazing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can store that and get enough fertile. Yeah, because there's a lot of air conditioners around the Pentagon. It's in, you know it's in a hot place, and, and there's millions. I mean, I don't know how many watts of stuff they do, but I mean it's huge. And so they they were actually gonna they were actually putting out a bid for that to have somebody do that. So he ended up moving to Vermont, and he has a micro hydro thing up in. Vermont. <coughs> That's the only place I've ever seen that work. Very very successful. Yeah. But. Um, uh, there's a shop across the street from where I am at the 200 block of Bridge. I just put up a green roof. It's like this wide, this deep, about 15 feet wide. He's feeding it from the drippings of his AC unit. Hmm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's going to grow some uh, cedar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as you said the wind came up and it dried out, then the rain came down, and he's having to redo it. But uh, if you're ever there, it's. Uh, it's called Alta Designs. They do um, a landscaping design, water management, and everything. State Farms in the front, Alta. State, State Farms in the back. Okay. Oh, okay. Take it out. But uh, yeah, just just put it up, and then all this weird weather happened. Yeah. The new normal came up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if there's any other questions, you guys can check some stuff out. You can look at this thing about the composting toilet. Um, I have never used one. This is Sunmark's Canadian company's made in Canada. They've been doing this for like 30 years. Okay, I've never that. used one, but I've sold 15 of these things. And oh. I've, I've had families of five using them. Not this, but this type of thing. Yeah. But, um, and I have two people that want uh, this one for a boat, one for an RV. So this one. This is the only one that's completely sealed, so you can move it around. There's another company that makes one of these. If you guys are into it, or if you have a cabin or something, it's called C Head. Look at the letter C dash head. Um, it's one of those things that it's really elegant because it's made with a five gallon bucket of toilet seat. There's a hole in the back of the toilet seat where this auger goes. In the front, it has a one gallon jug for the urine, male or female. And, um, and there's a little sight glass in the front so you can see how much pee is in it. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, so you get your handful of, say it's cedar, almost like a, like you might have in your hamster cage, whatever. Put it in there, do your business, and you throw a little bit more on top. Put the auger and the auger goes like this and rolls your poop in the thing and gets rid of the smell and the pee's in the front and when the thing is in the front's full, you just pull this lid up, take it out, Glug, glug, glug. You know, put it around your garden, maybe keep the deer away or something. I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's really that bad. I don't know what the law is. I did find something out. Um, when when a, a municipality doesn't know about something, they say you can't do it. <laughs> um, but I sold the electric version of this to um, somebody who's living at uh, what's the Ridley Park. At Ridley Park. He's living in a farmhouse at Ridley Park. He's part of the management there of, to some degree. Uh, the farmhouse uh, never had running water, never had a toilet. It's 200 and change years old. It's near the creek. He can't have a septic tank. He has one of these that the state bought him. He's had one, had one for 15 years and he told me it took my kids 15 years to break it. <laughs> it was just surprising because uh -huh. for like a family of four, it, it uh -huh. functions. Because the electric, we had an electric tray in there, an exhaust fan running. And he came in 
and bought it. And I can't remember whether I got a check from the state or Thanks not. Thanks the state, but, because you didn't get charged but, taxes. Yeah, it was state. State. And yeah. it was, so that tells me, so that's a precedent possibly for that, you know, moving forward. So if you could say, well, you know. But, um, yeah, there are a lot of these around. But then in Philly, the lady bought for her pool. Yeah, I sold them in Philly. Uh, someone uh, right outside. Uh, what's it? Um, what's it? Is that down Philly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chestnut Yeah, right at the edge of that. This woman has this eight hundred thousand dollar home, a pool, a pool house, and then she found out that her closed septic cesspool thing could not have any more flushing anything. So she built this ten thousand dollar pool room. Or the changing room, whatever you call those things. Mm -hmm. uh, just gorgeous, beautiful thing with this cut stone floor and all this stuff, and she can have a toilet. So if you bought one of those, mm -hmm. you know, we just put it in there, put it in, has a little exhaust fan on the right up the back, doesn't come up the top, very clean looking, does have a step up because the thing's actually a little higher than that. And uh, it's up and running. It's great, it's great, it's in Philly. We so sold some uh, horse farms in Chester Springs and Kennett Square. Yeah, I had one, one woman who got really excited about it because she, uh, she was cute. She was really excited about it. <laughs> she has a horse farm. She's got some money. Uh, the barn's about 100 yards from the house. Horses, they have water, they have electricity, but they have no bathroom or no way of having a bathroom. So she bought the composting toilet that has the electric setup on it. And, um, 100%. Yeah, she's fine. And then the Poconos. Yeah, you don't have to go anywhere. And they, they just, they work. There's, there's maintenance required. Something that just kind of freaks me out, and I don't understand the entire principle of composting and microbes and <coughs> enzymes and what they do to your poop, you know? So you put this peat moss and hemp stuff in there. You go, you tumble it. And it starts to dry out. Then you reverse the tumble and it drops it into this thing they call a finishing tray. They have all these really nice words. <laughs> <laughs> finishing tray. And this tray is this wide, about that long, about that deep on the full-size one. And for two people using it on a regular basis every day, you clean that thing out twice a year. Really? Wow. Twice a year. And I think, I have more poop on that. It's like twice a year. <laughs> 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 it is. It's that. Amazing. Twice, twice a year. I don't know what happens to it, but I do know it. <laughs> but then you just take it out. You can just dump it, not in your vegetable garden, but somewhere else. But um, I have a philosophy about human manure, but um, it's only that. It's no science. But the thing is that, um, yeah, with that in mind, I mean, you can, it's, it's, it's a doable thing, but you really have to do, you have to follow instructions. It's nothing that would work in the public, ever. People would just want to misuse it. Yeah. I talked to the, uh, one of the tech people up in Canada, and he very sarcastically said to me, he said, oh, by the way, no Super Bowl parties. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically just don't pour beer down it, because you throw off the, the ratio, the natural ratio of stuff, you know. Steve, you need special toilet paper with these things? Oh, yeah, well, toilet paper only. It's better if you use, like, really cheap. Yeah. Recycle that falls apart kind of solid toilet paper. None of the fluffy stuff like cut down a tree that's 100 year old fancy toilet paper. Use the what about newspaper? No. Use newspaper? Ouch. <laughs> 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 it has to break down. Somebody just is the Sears catalog. Well, it's fine as long as you really crumple it up. Yeah, you gotta crumple it up. That, that's true. Yeah. Yellow pages aren't bad. You can make some paint to fill that for a year. Yeah. <laughs> that's one of those things. Anything else? If not, I'll just let you guys come up and look at this stuff. Thanks so much, Steve. Yeah. Yeah.